And it is Friday, February 26th, still on chapter 22. Homework seven uh, for that chapter isn't due till next Wednesday, although we'll probably finish uh, on Monday most of the reactions. So you can get a head start on that homework if you want. But then we have test two looming out there over four chapters, 19 through 22. It'll be Wednesday through Friday in the testing center. Uh, I think there is that earlier close time on Friday. Make sure you double check that. Uh, avoid the late fee if you can. Take it earlier. Um, shouldn't be too much of a crush there on the line there. Maybe later in the afternoon on Friday there might be. So I don't know. I'll, we'll keep an eye on that and talk about that next week. Sample test two. Some people are already asking about that in my office hours. I helped a few people. <laughs> I could tell they're, they're preparing well for uh, test two and uh, working some of those problems on Learning Suite, and uh, you can see that. And we'll have time, I think, next Wednesday uh, to do some reviewing uh, for that. We'll have 22 pretty much done at that point. Questions on anything here? You okay on that? All right. Let's go over here on the sideboard and continue with more reactions with acid chlorides. So we're going to go through the progression of what derivatives of carboxylic acids, and we started with the most uh, reactive ones, the acid chlorides, so they have the best leaving group. And then we'll do anhydrides and esters today. Esters are probably the most prominent family, a lot of versatility there. They're of intermediate stability and reactivity, so they're more versatile than a lot of the others. And in biology in particular, I have some good uh, examples to show you on the overhead near here in a, in a minute but let's do these here and you can see we're going from a more reactive derivative to a less reactive one a more stable one the anhydride you can always go from left to right to form the more stable thing you cannot go backwards here from the anhydride to the acid chloride okay you, in theory you know you could say well what if we react this with chloride cl minus could we go back to that? No. We get to a tetrahedral intermediate where the chloride would be the better leaving group. Okay. So we can always go left to right, but we can't go from right to the left. Okay. To the more reactive one. So it kind of limits things, but uh, let's see uh, what we need to do here. And what's PYR? That's pyridine. So that's just a modest base that's often in there to soak up HCl. And we'll see some variations. Sometimes the book leaves out the base. I'll, I'll talk about base in a couple particular spots just to clue you in there. If you leave it out or change the base on a quiz or a test, you'd still get full credit, but I think showing it uh, is useful that way. So how does this reaction go? Well, a couple things we could do, you know, pyridine, how strong is that? Protonated pyridine, the pK is about five and the pKa of a carboxylic acid. Our nucleophile in this case is about five. So you don't have to deprotonate it. There's some variations here uh, that we could do on this, but let's go ahead and attack here with our nucleophile and tetrahedral intermediate. So everything follows this pathway, right? So we've got O minus here, chloride, and then O with our, uh, acetic acid there. Okay. So yeah, tetrahedral intermediate here. And what do we do? Bring the electrons back down, kick off chloride, which is our better leaving group in this case. And we'll get our protonated anhydride. Oh, I think there's just, yeah, there's just two here. I'm making a mixed anhydride, kind of showing you to differentiate the two sides. We could make symmetric anhydrides using this, but right now we still have this on here. Now, like I said, we could have used pyridine here to take that off uh, before, but let's see the structure of pyridine. Oh yeah, it's that nitrogen benzene compound, okay? And what's that gonna do? It's just gonna take that proton off. And that, yeah, that will give us a product and our byproduct, you see, is pyridinium the protonated form, um, chloride. And that's often a salt. Um, well, yeah, it's a salt. It's often not soluble in the, the solvent that we're using here. I didn't specify the solvent. We could use a lot of different solvents, just not water, okay? 
or ethanol or methanol. We don't want anything that's nucleophilic here, solvent-wise. So sometimes it's just a simple thing like hexanes, a hydrocarbon, okay? And that nonpolar hexane solvent, you see, this would precipitate out, which helps, uh, you know, keep the HCl away. <laughs> And we can purify things easy, right? Just filter that off. And all we've got left in our hexanes at that point is our desired anhydride, okay? So operationally, I like to throw in a little bit there, but questions on the mechanism? <laughs> it's just the same as we saw before, right? Nucleophile coming in, tetrahedral intermediate, and pick the better leaving group, in this case, chloride, okay? Ah, here's one here, acid chloride with alcohol. And let's do our attack here. So we've got uh, benzoyl chloride here and ethanol. And the mechanism would be, what, the tetrahedral intermediate again, O minus chloride and protonated alcohol, okay? And, you know, I, I showed pyridine deprotonating the product here. We could have deprotonated right here with pyridine. Those are little variations I told you. Just proton transfers, that's not the important thing. The important thing is the attack in the tetrahedral intermediate and then seeing what leaving group's going to come off. And that will give us the carbonyl back and what our protonated form of our ester product and chloride came off. And how do we get that? Well, then pyridine does its thing, right? You can show that to be uh, thorough there. And you get the same by byproduct, pyridinium chloride byproduct there. But yeah, very efficient reaction. These are called acyl transfers. We're transferring the acyl group. An acyl group is a carbonyl with something else on the side. So it's an acyl group with a leaving group, right? And we're doing the attack. And then transferring this acyl group from chloride to what? To the alcohol to make an ester product. Okay. Questions on that? All right. Let's look at the, uh, the one here to form an amide. And here's a different chloride plus uh, an amine here. Dimethylamine. And notice that's a secondary amine. This is okay for uh, primary amines and for just ammonia. But look at this, tertiary amines, no. <laughs> and what this will form very efficiently is the amide. That's a very good nucleophile, okay? And what base can we use? Well, the amine itself is a base. We could use excess of the amine. If we don't wanna waste all the amine base, we can actually use sodium hydroxide here. I like to put an exclamation point there. Because we know sodium hydroxide is a base, right? We also know it as a nucleophile. It's a charged nucleophile. So what's up here? This could be the nucleophile here instead. Why are we using this as a nucleophile? It's neutral. Ah, but that's 2.8 on the Pauling scale. This pair of electrons is very available, right? Even though it's neutral, it's a good nucleophile. In fact, it's a better nucleophile than hydroxide. The hydroxide's a cheaper base than pyridine, so we're gonna use that to soak up the HCl, okay? <laughs> there is a little practical detail for you there. But let's do the, the mechanism. Yeah, I told you you'd be bored by these mechanisms. They're all the same, right? <laughs> Nucleophile in, tetrahedral intermediate, comes back out, <clears throat> O minus, chloride, amine, two methyls. Oh, and don't forget your formal charges there. Make sure you're, you know, careful about that. <clears throat> Chloride coming back down. And what do we get? We get the protonated form of the amide. Now this is the important thing, right? Hydroxide, there has to be a hydrogen here, right? To go to the neutral amide. This is the product. The amide resonance lone pair makes this stable. If you can't go to this lone pair here, and that would be the problem with the tertiary amine, right? If we had another alkyl group here, hydroxide would just add here and you'd kick off the tertiary amine, okay? So you see that you need this, uh, at least a secondary 
like we're showing here. But primary means and simple ammonia will work too because they'll still have this here. And then how do we get to the product here? Oh, yeah, OH. Grab that. Oh, and you see that puts that lone pair on there to get the amid. Okay. <clears throat> Questions on that? <laughs> so we formed a bunch of different products, a lot of variations there from that. Questions so far? All right, let's do uh, anhydrides, which are the next most reactive group over. So anhydrides, let's stick with uh, acetic anhydride. That's probably the most common one. And let's see, let's make uh, an ester from it. And we're going to switch over here and use catalytic H2SO4. Okay, so sometimes we use base, okay, with the acid chlorides because we were generating HCl. We wanted to make sure we neutralize that. Here, because we're a little less reactive than acid chlorides now, we can take advantage of the fact that we can protonate a carbonyl and make the electrophile more reactive, okay? So before we were just neutralizing, just taking a proton off. But here's a little variation, okay? If... Uh, we left out the H2SO4, it would still go, uh, and our byproduct would be acetic acid, okay? And you'll see that. Acetic acid is not a strong enough acid to protonate the starting thing and make the, the first reaction uh, fast enough. But let's, let's use the acid here to protonate, okay? So it's a little bit different trick, you could say. But it's really the same thing. We're increasing the reactivity of the electrophile that we've done before in, in cases, right? And then, uh, you know, you want to have uh, your alcohol attack that side. Why that side? Because we've got two carbonyls, right? We could have attacked here, but we attack here. Why? Because that's the side we protonated, okay? So when we go to the tetrahedral intermediate, we'll see that as the more stable thing. So let's look. We've got OH here now. We've got O. <clears throat> There, and we have acetate on there, okay? And notice if we're under acidic conditions, all our intermediates are what? Cations now, <laughs> okay? Uh, what can we do here? Uh, we can transfer this proton here to be a little more thorough about this. And if we do that, you see we have the protonated form of the leaving group now. And we have the ethoxy group uh, on there. And let's uh, bring the pair of electrons down here. Here's our leaving group, right? Okay. And that's what the anhydride is. It's just like chloride now. But under the protic conditions, it's a little better, we could say. And what does that go to? Oh, protonated ester. And then how do we get to the final product, which will be ethyl acetate, the solvent? Okay. Uh, we need to take this proton off here. And we could do that a couple different ways. We have excess uh, uh, ethanol. A lot of times when we do these alcohol reactions, it's implied to be excess just to make them go faster. We may not always show that, but you know, make sure you can identify your nuclear well. So what base could we use here? We could use ethanol or bisulfate, either one. Let's use ethanol. We probably have more of that anyway, <laughs> okay. We well, see that'll generate our product and regenerate uh, some acid uh, catalyst, okay? And whether that proton's on an alcohol or uh, on the bisulfate, it doesn't really matter. But yeah, so here's acidic conditions for forming, what, an ester from an, uh, from an acid anhydride, okay? Questions on that? All right, let's look at, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, so our leaving group here, uh, yeah, I didn't specify that. What is it? Okay, <laughs> so let's keep everything in the same spot. Yeah, so what came off? Acetic acid. <laughs> so good question. Somebody's asking, specify what the leaving group is. I mentioned leaving group, and here it is coming off, that bond on the tetrahedral intermediate is the key thing. And giving you a little more detail, you can see it's acetic acid. Okay, coming off of that. Good question. Thank you. Let's... Uh,
show how to make amides. And amides can be made from acetic anhydride or other anhydrides. Amides are more stable, right? So we can do this. And let's uh, look at benzyl amide. <clears throat> and uh, we can just leave this like this. Uh, or we could show the base, either pyridine or hydroxide will do this. And so what are we looking at here? <clears throat> can do this, O minus. And here the leaving group's gonna be a little bit different maybe. And that benzyl is a methylene with a uh, benzene on it. So that would be plus charge. And then this can come down. And oh, let's just grab the proton directly there. <laughs> So I'm kind of truncating some of the mechanisms. You can add the rest of that detail if you'd like, but that would give us the benzyl amide, okay? N-benzyl acid amide uh, or ethanamide, just to remind you of the name there, but similar type of intermediates. And I'm not specifying the base. Here I'm using the leaving group to kind of grab the proton. And that could occur, even if we didn't put in a base here. This would still go be nucleophilic enough to, uh, to do that. All right, we can also do these type of reactions with uh, cyclic anhydrides. And these are a little bit of a tricky uh, thing here. And anhydrides, you know, have two acyl groups on them. So how about if we had this type of anhydride with what? Um, two uh, carbonyls. It's a cyclic anhydride, and let's do that with, oh, how about methylamine? And if we do this reaction, you see, we're going to attack one here, and one carbonyl is the electrophile. The other one now is going to be the leaving group. Okay. So we can look at the tetrahedral intermediate here, and you can see we're not able to substitute both of them we'd have to do a different reaction for that. But we'd have this type of intermediate, right? And then bring the paraloxins back down. And you see now we have that as our leaving group and specifying that. And let's see, we can grab the protons there off that. So what would be our product? It would be the, the uh, carboxylic acid <laughs> amide. Okay, only one of them is functionalized as an amide. The other was our leaving group here, okay? So it's a little bit different there. There are some uh, cyclic anhydrides that are easily formed. You can take this molecule, which we learned before its name. Anybody remember the name of this dye? Carboxylic acid starts with an S. <laughs> Let's see. What's the name of a dicarboxylic acid? What's that? Succinic acid. Yeah, very good. So we can take succinic acid and actually just heat it up. And look, we've got, right, a nucleophile here. We got the potential to form an intramolecular reaction here. And by heating it up, and you have to heat it up to, you know, about over 100 degrees or so, and that's beyond the boiling point of water, right? So that'll start to come off. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole mechanism there, but we can form these type of cyclic anhydrides. That's succinic anhydride. And those can be, you know, reacted in different ways. For example, we could react that with just ammonia then, and we'd get the, uh, the intermediate here, or this product if we just stopped at that point, you see, we'd add the elements of, uh, of that across there. One is the electrophile, the other becomes the leaving group. And there's a proton transfer thing. I think you can get the, the mechanism, but this is uh, uh, succin amide, okay, succinic acid amide, where one's a carboxylic acid. And now if you keep heating this, after you have this in here, look, you have the potential to do another intramolecular reaction. And from these cyclic anhydrides, you can get the cyclic uh, diacylamine. That's called an imid. Okay, and imids uh, uh, 
Remember we did that reagent NBS, and bromo succinimid. <laughs> if you put a bromo on that, that's another step. I'm not talking about this. But this is succinimid. This has an imid now. And you can see here, this is another minus water type reaction. After we reacted the anhydride with an amine, okay? So you can practice those mechanisms. That's a little bit harder extension of it. The key thing here is when you react with a cyclic anhydride, you get the monoamide carboxylic acid, okay? And we could heat this one up too and get that to go. But the nice thing about these, these five, and there's the glutaric ones also, that has a six-membered uh, ring that you can easily form the second ones. The seven-membered ring is a little bit harder to form, but it... Uh, yeah, it's the example we're showing there. Questions on the cyclic uh, process? I think you'd see that. It's not much of an extension there, but uh, there's some good things there. All right, let's get into esters. Yes, please, question. No, this is a primary amine. The question is the difference between these amines. This is a primary amine. It has one alkyl group on it or ammonia. Okay, ammonia has some other protons you can lose. Yeah, yeah, same reactivity, yeah. Only here you gotta keep track of where that uh, methyl group ends up. Yeah, so here we kinda just left it as a line there. And here, when we did this, you see we ended up with two here and eventually one there as we lost more water, yeah. So you can track that with the mechanism, I think, okay. All right, let's look at esters. And uh, <clears throat> Esther's next uh, family down. And this is where we're going to spend most of our time today, <laughs> going through the ester reactions. And we're actually going to look at ester formation first. Uh, you can already see, you know, how we can react to form amides. Uh, we can hydrolyze esters to carboxylic acids. Um, I have a feel for that. But ester formation, let's see here. Let's make the simple one. Let's take uh, ethanol, and we're going to add uh, catalytic acid. Oh, let's have a specific one, sulfuric acid. Now, if you don't have the sulfuric acid in there, <laughs> or some acid, if you mix a neutral carboxylic acid with an alcohol, you get no reaction. Okay, those guys will swim around forever together and give nothing. Well, once you put the catalytic acid in here, you can very quickly form the ester. This is called the Fischer esterification. This is how most simple esters are made. It's kind of tough conditions here because this is a strong acid, and sometimes we have to heat this up. Okay, and you'll see why we're heating up there. We're going to be driving off the elements of water. Okay. So, what's our mechanism? I'd like to talk about the mechanism here using a uh, isotopic label. Heavy oxygen here on the oxygen of the alcohol. Where will that end up in the product? These type of experiments were done early on to establish the mechanism of the Fischer esterification. Yes, it'll involve the tetrahedral intermediate. It'll be in common with everything else we've seen. But you could think about, you know, other things here, right? You could think about protonating the alcohol, have that as a leaving group, and have this oxygen be the nucleophile, okay? Or this oxygen here. And that would put the label in different places. So let's see, where will that label end up, the heavy oxygen? It'll end up on the alkoxy oxygen, okay? And let's see if our mechanism can track that pathway. What do we do here? Let's protonate the carboxylic acid. And we actually protonate the carbonyl oxygen because that can give us resonance stabilization of this protonated form here. And then we attack with uh, our alcohol, okay? And look, you know, we're already doing the same thing here, right? We're doing the tetrahedral intermediate, okay? So yeah, there's a few steps here. And we notice we've already gotten the oxygen on the carbon, right? Where this will become a carbonyl at that point. Let's take a, a proton transfer step here. We often do that to switch which group is going to be the better leaving group now, right? These are all freely reversible. We can reverse this reaction back 
if we add water to the ester and acid, right? So uh, Fischer esterification, the formation, is the same pathway as hydrolysis, okay, breaking apart the ester bond. But we're looking at it in a forward direction, forming esters right now. So if we transfer that proton, what do we get? get oh, two hydrogens, hydronium ion, and ethyl, okay? And then what? Like now we can lose water. So there's a loss of water step over the arrow. And we don't go directly to the product, we go to the protonated form of the ester. Okay. <laughs> and then one more step, going to the product. And you know, what can we do there? Well, often we have excess of the alcohol. Okay. And these simpler alcohols, yeah, it's the solvent, ethanol or methanol. Just have those dumped in there. Um, could use bisulfate, you'd still get full credit. But there's our loss of water. We can heat that up and remove that from the equilibrium and drive it toward formation of the uh, ester product. So let's see, where will all label end up? Well, there it is, 18. That's a heavier isotope with an extra, what, neutron in the nucleus. And we can track that with the mass spec, whatever. And there it is, still there, okay. And there it is there. Oh, yep. You see it never moves, it stays at that point. Other mechanisms might scramble the position of that isotopic label. So this is a way to track that. I'm not gonna go through those alternative mechanisms. This one fits into what we've been talking about. There's our tetrahedral intermediate, okay? And switch it around and here's our leaving group. So just keeping track of that. And how does the leaving group come off? As neutral water, okay? And with the excess, uh, excess there. Questions on f Fisher esterification? Emil Fisher developed this, the same person who did all the sugar chemistry we'll see later on, uh, won the Nobel Prize uh, for a number of things, but uh, this is one of the key reactions. Taking carboxylic acid and turning it into a ester, okay? So other alcohols can work and other uh, products there. One other reaction to show you here, uh, and that's the intermolecular one. You can take a hydroxy alcohol and treat that with acid, heat it up, and what do you get? The one, two, three, four, five membered, what? Alpha, beta, gamma, what do we call this? <laughs> intramolecular reaction here. Uh, what do we call this? Have I got the right number of carbons? One, two, three methylenes there. Yeah, one, two, three. Five-membered ring. You remember the name of these cyclic esters? Starts with an L. <laughs> lactone, right? So these cyclic uh, lactones. Gamma and delta are the ones that can form easily in this type of process. Intramolecular esterification, you could say. Mechanism's exactly the same, okay? except it's within the same molecule. Uh, one other on formation here. Let's take uh, benzoic acid and treat it first with sodium hydroxide. Yeah, and don't forget about acid-base chemistry, right? So this will form benzoate and water and the sodiums there. And then let's react this with ethyl iodide. What type of reaction are we doing here? And what are we forming? We're forming an ester, right? <laughs> and this will give us the benzyl ester. And what type of reaction is that? SN2. Okay, so you already know that one, <laughs> nucleophilic addition. But that's from a alkyl halide, right? It's a little more convenient, I think, to do it from a cheaper alcohol and uh, do the esterification there. But that gives you uh, that option there. Let's see. Ah, let's uh, do the hydrolysis of, uh, no, let's see. Ah, Jishiran, I think we want to go to the overhead here. We've got a couple things to show you on the overhead application-wise. <clears throat> We already talked about that, different esters and derivatives, carboxylic acids, different places, including membranes. Should be able to identify those things. And look at the formation here. Here we have an alcohol, 
This is glycerol or glycerin. It's all in all your cosmetic lotions and whatever. It's a nice uh, feeling uh, compound. Not too greasy, but it uh, you know has the uh, OH groups on it. First reaction is a kinase to put on a phosphate. And then look, it's reacted with thioesters inside cells to make the diesters here. And a thioester is more reactive than a regular oxygen ester. Why? Because that's a longer bond, better leaving group, actually. Okay. So thioesters in biology are more reactive. And it gives the uh, diester product here. It can go on to the acyl triglyceride, or it can go on to the uh, phosphatidylcholine lecithin which is in the lipid bilayer membrane. Let's look at another reaction, though, to form esters. And this is the so-called DCC esterification. DCC stands for dicyclohexyl carbodiimide. Now, this is a different type of imide that has a carbon doubly bonded twice between two nitrogens. Okay? That makes the central carbon very electrophilic in between two more electronegative nitrogens. And this is a nice reaction because it's mild. There's no acid or base involved here, okay? And it's at one-to-one -one stoichiometry for the carboxylic acid and whatever alcohol we're interested in. We can have complex alcohols here. We don't have to use it in excess as a solvent here. Carboxylic acid with the DCC, and it's fast. It's done in minutes. Well, why is that? That's not a great leaving group OH, right? Ah, but the DCC converts the acid into a great leaving group, which is this uranium type intermediate. So the mechanism starts out with O minus here attacking that central carbon, transfer a proton over here. Okay, I'm not showing that part of it. But now we have the better leaving group here, uh, the alcohols, the nucleophile, tetrahedral intermediate, push the electrons off, transfer a proton there. And look, our byproduct's called urea. Okay. Now, if these two cyclohexyl groups weren't there, that would be the metabolic form of urea, the waste product from higher animals, excess nitrogen. And this is a very stable thing. You got a lot of resonance here. And notice that's the elements of water, oxygen, H2O, yeah, added across the carbodiamine. So it's a fantastic reagent. Uh, it was developed in the early 60s, and it facilitated a lot of new chemistry, including peptide formation and protein formation. We'll see this later in the context of amide formation. Okay, You can take an, an amine, carboxylic acid, one-to-one -one, okay, with the DCC, same intermediate, same leaving group, a better nucleophile now, the amine actually, same tetrahedral intermediate with the transfer of the proton, regenerate the carbonyl. You go directly to the amide now and the urea byproduct. So that's a driving force for the reaction, but it's very fast, done in minutes, one-to-one. Um, -one. You don't have to waste a lot of material. And oftentimes it's super high yield. It can be in the high 90% yield for this type of reaction. So questions on the DCC esterification or the DCC amide formation? Um, we can say more about that later when we get to uh, proteins in a later chapter, but this gives you another approach to ester formation. Now, speaking of esters, you've probably heard of polyesters, right? The bad leisure suits in the 1960s, these guys with these lime green, shiny sport coats on. <laughs> it's kind of become a very negative thing. Oh, polyester, oh, that's plastic and synthetic stuff. Yeah, well, there are a lot of these uh, polyesters that are known. Uh, they have plastic-like uh, uh, properties. They're long chains here. X can be hundreds or thousands of units long. They can be drawn into fibers, Dacron fibers made into all sorts of clothing articles or, or building materials, carpet fibers, whatever. Or they can be molded. There's, they're resins, okay? So they can be melted and injected and form whatever thing you want here. Terephthalic acid is uh, the one component in ethylene glycol. These both come from petroleum. So they're not renewable that way, but you just heat it up with catalytic acid and there's your Fischer esterification we just talked about. But it, you, you do it on both ends, right? And that can grow that polymer. It's called a condensation polymer. It's different than the alkene polymers we saw at the end of 351 
in chapter uh, 15 there. Um, so these materials, I won't say anything about the mechanical properties and everything, but Dacron is the trade name. P PET, P-E-T-E, -E, for polyethylene terephthalate. <laughs> um, phthalic acid here, but... Uh, yeah, that's just one of them. Here's the renewable one now that's becoming uh, more common. This is PLA. What's that stand for? Polylactic acid. Lactic acid's natural source. It can come from different microorganisms or uh, the action of yeast on different plant materials. Form all the lactic acid you want. You can polymerize it just by heating it in acid, and there's PLA. It has a stereocenter, right? This is the one from bacteria, I think, the R. The one in higher animals, the lactic acid is the S stereochemistry. It doesn't matter there. But you can see there's the ester and there's the monomer units. I think I have four monomers there. You can also make it from this thing called lactide dimer, which is a liquid material. It's a little easier to handle. Then if you heat it up, like in the nozzle, the jet nozzle of a 3D printer, it will actually form the solid PLA material <laughs> on demand, okay, as it comes through that hot nozzle. Anybody done 3D printing before? Okay, a PLA is the thing you can colorize it and, you know, have different lengths there, and different materials, but uh, that's opened up a lot of things. But again, that's renewable. Okay, this is one of these green polymers, and it's biodegradable. Peat uh, takes a long time to fall apart in the landfill, whereas PLA, they can both be recycled, whatever, but uh, PLA just degrades to natural uh, lactic acid. Um, biodiesel, have you heard about this before? <laughs> There's Willie Nelson, the singer. He's actually big time. He has a company in Texas. There's a number of these companies. These fuels come from uh, plant oils, right? Or algae oils or waste oils from McDonald's, whatever. After the, the, McDon the, uh, the fry machine has, has done its thing, you can recycle those plant oils. And it's a transesterification reaction where you take the, the acyl triglyceride, which is your fat molecule in nature, and treat it with methanol and sodium methoxide, and you make the methyl esters of the long chain fatty acids, okay? So it's the same thing we've been talking about. Here's our nucleophile, there's our electrophile, tetrahedral intermediates, collapse back down, but now you don't go to an acid here hydrolyzing it, you go to the other ester. That's why it's called a transesterification. This has the same properties as regular diesel fuel coming from petroleum. That's higher boiling than octane, uh, uh, which is the stuff that goes into most uh, car engines. Diesel engines are not based on a spark combustion with a spark plug. It's compression ignition, right? It's a different type of engine. Uh, but you can have this renewable source of a fuel now. And then I sing these biofuels, these biodiesels, go right into the regular engines, okay? It's the same thing. Comparable price for the diesel fuel compared to a petroleum diesel. It can be used for other applications as well, but this is becoming a major source of renewable fuels now. So maybe that's the bottom line. I think <laughs> carboxylic acid derivatives now offer a lot of uh, viable solutions to solve a lot of political problems around the world concerning waste and, and energy issues. And biodiesel, you see Willie's smiling there. He's happy this is uh, working. <laughs> He's uh, putting it into his bus there, his tour bus, whatever. But <laughs> it's made from uh, a, a renewable source of, uh, of hydrocarbons there, the acyl triglyceride. Transesterification, I think you can figure out that mechanism. It gives a byproduct glycerol, but that can also be used in cosmetics. Okay, so uh, it's kind of a dual uh, thing there. I mentioned these before when we looked at different molecules that had derivatives of carboxylic acid here on NAD. You see the amide here. It's a couple amides down here. Acyl-CoA. This is a molecule that transfers acyl groups in biology, and it's linked as a thioester. Now, thioesters are more reactive than normal oxygen esters. This is a longer bond, less resonance than the oxygen ester, so you can react that better. These are a little more stable than anhydrides, but not much. They're more reactive than oxygen esters. And why does nature do that? So here's the whole story of bioacylation. What do you mean by acylation? Well, this acyl group off this carboxylate is going to be transferred to different things now. So I keep this generic, kind of generalized. Start out as carboxylic acids, react with a molecule of ATP. What does ATP stand for? That's an acronym you've probably heard before, right? What does it stand for? 
Anybody rattle it off? Adenosine triphosphate. <laughs> there you see the triphosphate, which is right here. There's some magnesium uh, plus two cations here, which kind of neutralize the negative charge. Because we're thinking about reacting here, this highly negatively charged phosphate with a negatively charged carboxylate. Those would repel each other. But there's magnesium cations here uh, that help neutralize that. The enzyme's called a kinase, which means it transfers a phosphate to a group. And here's the phosphate group now on the acyl group. How reactive are acyl phosphates compared to the other derivatives we've talked about? Well, it's an anhydride, you could say, of a carboxylic acid and phosphoric acid. Okay? And that potentially is a very good leaving group then, phosphate, right? Nature then converts phosphates here into thioesters. And of course, these are driven by enzymes. I'm not showing all the mechanism here, but you can see you get to a tetrahedral intermediate, and that would collapse down and phosphate would be your leaving group. And that would put on a thioester, okay? So make sure you can follow that mechanism, okay, and see why we're going now to the more stable oxygen ester. There's a number of alcohols in biology, choline, the neurotransmitter, cholesterol needs to be transported through the body, glycerol, you need to make fats. And so all these alcohols here, you're gonna attack the thioester and transfer that ACE group now to an ester. Okay? <laughs> Mother nature is a control freak. Why does you have to go through this intermediate, then that intermediate, then that intermediate? That's so the body, the organism can respond to different conditions and have complete control over making these type of esters. So you'll learn more about that in biochemistry. I just like to point it out in this chapter. Fatty acids, we've already seen this. You can see uh, the thioester here with glycerol putting on the acyl triglyceride. And yeah, the saturated ones are the higher melting ones. They tend to be solids at room temperature. The unsaturated ones, polyunsaturated especially, are what liquids at room temperature. So you should be aware of that. Yeah, we won't go into that. We'll see this later when we do the aldol chapter. We'll see the whole story there. Questions on any of that? Now, now what do you need to know here? <laughs> you need to know what? Those mechanisms, at least in general, and why they're going from the uh, phosphate anhydride down to the oxygen ester, okay? And that's the hierarchy of reactivity. I think you can follow that. And again, the biology and all that stuff, don't worry about that. All right, let's look at hydrolysis of esters now. And ester hydrolysis, a couple ways to do it. We're gonna do it under acidic conditions and we're gonna do it under uh, basic conditions. So again, reacting esters. And let's do this one sodium hydroxide, and we're gonna to go to the sodium carboxylate. And these are similar products. You see we're breaking or lysing the ester bond, or we can do the same thing, but with acid. Now, if we use acid in water, we go to the carboxylic acid, okay? because the pKa here is five. If we're acidic, we're gonna have that protonated. And we have the same alcohol product here, okay? This top one's a special case here. If this is a long chain fatty acid here, this is soap, <laughs> okay? This can form the micelles and have the cleaning action. In fact, this reaction here with base here is called saponification. <laughs> uh, and that's from a Latin term, I think that means soap. It's not from the Spanish sapo, that, that means toad or frog, right? Is it toad or frog? I forget, any Spanish speaker? Sapo, so it's not the, not the Spanish thing, but saponification is forming soap. And you can do it from the acyl triglyceride. And like I said, if you have a long chain here, uh, fatty acid, that's the thing that can form the soap, it can form the micelles, but it's not this, okay? This is the one keeping it uh, protonated. You can convert that, you know, if you take the saponification product and then acidify at the end, then you can get the neutral thing. But know the state here of which one's gonna go. Let's do the mechanism here, the first one. It's pretty easy, I think. <laughs> what do you have? O minus, <laughs> OH, OF oxy. Negatively charged under basic conditions, right? 
Bring the electrons down, kick off what? Kick off the ester. Now we could have kicked off either one. Why are we kicking off the ester? Well, um, we have hydroxide in there. We could go the other way and go back to that. But once we form some of the alcohol and we're in water, that alcohol, when it comes off, is going to grab a proton and then be solvated by the water. So it's kind of an equilibrium thing again. We have the acid there initially generated. But look, we're in the presence of O minus right here, right? So what's going to happen instantaneously as that tetrahedral intermediate breaks down? This is a very strong base now, this leaving group, right? That just came off. And that's just going to grab our proton and give us the carboxylate plus the alcohol. Because the pK of an alcohol is, what, 16? pK of the carboxylic acid is 5. So you can see why this last step. That's not reversible here. This uh, would be reversible here. But once that pops off, that's it. Okay, then you got that at that point. And like I said, if we wanted the neutral thing, we'd have to, in a second step, acidify, lower the pH below, what, 5 in order to get that. Okay. Let's look at the acid hydrolysis. And that's, that's probably it today. Uh, yeah, we did ester formation. <laughs> We're blowing the esters apart. That seems kind of counterproductive, doesn't it? But <laughs> it's the versatility of these reactions, right? So we have an ester here, and we're in water, and we have acid. Now, if it's just water in the ester, no reaction. We have to have the acid in there. And how is this going to occur? Well, same thing, protonate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we have our protonated ester. Okay. And then water can do its thing. And what do we get? OH. Oh. Yeah, and I kind of flipped it around. Sometimes we've had it, you know, closer to it. But tetrahedral intermediate, right? And how do we get rid of this now? Well, we need to transfer a proton to make this into a leaving group. We could go backwards here, right? But again, we're forming the alcohol and that's going to uh, be solvated by the water in this case. So now we have hydronium ion over here on the alkoxy part. And let's use a pair of electrons to help push that off. We could pull this off without bringing this pair of electrons down. I like to show that because you see the carbonyl formation back, right? So that's, that's an important thing, I think. But what does that give us? The protonated form of the acid and the alcohol, okay? It's just the reverse of the Fischer esterification. <laughs> They've gone in both directions today. And then how do we get the product here? Um, well, this can take that proton off. And that gives us the carboxylic acid and the alcohol. Well, the alcohol is already here. The alcohol, you know, can, well, or, or let's use water here. Yeah, sorry. We have more water than the alcohol. So the alcohol will stay here and just get solvated by the rest of the water, I think, yeah. Question on that, just the reverse of the Fischer esterification. Um, <clears throat> one other thing to show you here on the mechanism real quick <clears throat> on uh, saponification. If we have a chiral ester, so there's an ester, and at that alkoxy position, it has a stereocenter. What is that? I think that's... S. Let's do the reaction with sodium hydroxide. So we're saponifying our nucleophile as hydroxide, right? What happens to the alcohol? Okay, well, the acid will be benzoate, sodium benzoate. A lot of times we don't draw those charges for you, okay? And then the alcohol, what? Is it going to be R or S? What do you think? There's another benzene.
can you tell whether we're going to maintain that stereocenter or invert it? There's a couple different mechanisms we could go through here. But if we go through this mechanism, which is the known one, that stereocenter is maintained, right? So again, this is more evidence for the tetrahedral intermediate. We could attack right here and do a displacement there with that as a leaving group in an SN2 type reaction, right? <laughs> that turns out not to be the mechanism because our product of our alcohol is still uh, S. So yeah, I think you can draw the tetrahedral intermediate and see how that will break down to maintain the stereo center there. Question on that. And I think that's good. Let's see. Uh, saponification, we did that. Bioisolation. Um, yeah, we'll get into amides next time and a little bit more on that. Oh, and we got nitriles too. Yeah, so we have a little bit more in this chapter. And obviously, we've got uh, Monday and Wednesday to go over that a little bit more. So I think we're okay. Questions on this so far? Okay. You okay with the two different mechanisms here for uh, breaking apart or hydrolyzing an ester, either basic conditions, which give the carboxylate salt product, right? Or acid conditions with water will give the neutral acid and the neutral alcohol. So that's important to, to keep those two different products straight. They are different products, right? The one can have soap-like properties, of saponification it's called, but the other one will give the neutral acid there. But uh, yeah, and then the stereochemistry here kind of enforces this tetrahedral intermediate. Anyway, is that okay? Questions, anything? You okay? All right, hopefully you got off to a good start here on your weekend. <laughs> Be reviewing all these chapters and we'll finish probably on Monday, the rest of the reactions for 22. And then we'll have time to review, I think, on, on Wednesday. So very good. We'll see you next week.